It's biology with Mr. V. Biology with Mr. V. That's me. Hey, oh, another recording, I'm afraid, today. And this one is, well, a couple of things I want to do. The first thing is I set you in the last sort of cover lesson to complete some tasks for me, for tasks one to four in this cellular control booklet. So I want to go over them. So you're going to need a green pen to start this. And when we've gone over them, I want to introduce to you the second of our spec points, the spec point, I forget what the numbers are, but B, to begin looking at how you can control gene expression. How you can control whether genes are switched on and switched off. Well, we're actually going to focus on the big one, which is transcriptional level uh, gene expression in prokaryotes and an example called a LAC operon. So very, very, very brand new. And I want you to go into this thinking it's the worst thing you're ever going to see in your life. Because I promise you, by the time you finish this recording and you've done the work and gone over it, you'll be like, oh, that wasn't too bad. Seriously, it'd be really hard. He's a liar. Actually, no, maybe that's not a good thing. Either way, expect this to be really difficult. Every word, more or less, will be brand new. So expect it to be challenging. But as we go through it step by step, and with a recording, you've got the ability to rewind me and watch me again. We should be fine by the end. So let's start with going over the tasks. So I am not daft. I could spend 20 minutes going through task one, or I could save myself some time here, you know, thinking, thinking strategically by knowing that these are questions from the textbook and knowing that on Teams, in our A-level biology resources file, folder, team, whatever, if I go into files, and I go to class materials, and A-level, I know that I have a file called textbook mark schemes. So I can literally click on that one, go to the page 172, whatever it was, and get the exact mark scheme to go over it. Easy peasy. I must admit, I've not had anyone tell me that I've had issues with these questions. Um, I've had a few sort of um, questions on Teams. Just by the way, those who have got in touch with me on Teams with questions about the work, thank you. Like, you can't have been the only one. So thank you for actually trying to sort it there and then. That's, that's how our brains work. We get a problem. If we just like forget about it for three or four days, we forget about why the problem occurred. So an explanation going over it doesn't help as much. But if you try to address the problem at the time, that actually ensures we don't form incorrect sort of functions in our brain. We form the correct knowledge, memory and the correct knowledge moving forward. So well done those who did get in touch. I, just in case you can hear any amazing singing, that's my daughter having a bath upstairs. Um, she's quite loud, but never mind. Hopefully I'm louder. So task two, three and four, I don't have a mark scheme like that to direct you to. So I am going to go through it. Though I have noticed that on PDFs on this laptop, I've not seen this before. I should be able to do some writing. So this might be a bit better. Either way. So I do like these tasks. You're given lots of information, which is good because you're forced to you're forced to read. You're forced to just get that that extra bit. And you then just ask some relatively kindish questions to go over sort of the specifics. So in terms of mutation, a mutation can be neutral, beneficial and harmful. And that's that's any type of mutation, whether it's point mutation, indel mutations, they can either be neutral, beneficial or harmful. If you are neutral, the idea is that there is no effect. Specifically, no effect in protein function because Effectively, if we have a mutation, it's all about affecting the gene, the amino acid sequence of that gene. And if you're affecting amino acid sequence, well, then you're affecting the shape of the protein. If you're affecting the shape of the protein, you're affecting protein function. So if you're neutral, there was no effect. That's either because it was a point mutation and it's a degenerate mutation. So 
Yeah, different triplet code, but same amino acid. Or maybe it was a different amino acid, but it just doesn't make a big enough difference to the overall tertiary structure of that protein. Harmful is where you get a different amino acid. And I was going to write I was going to write different protein structures. Probably not the best thing to do for harmful. I should actually write a negative protein function. It is not as easy to write on this as it is other things. Never mind. So if it's harmful, yep, you get a different amino acid. You get a different tertiary structure of your protein. And if that protein no longer functions how it's supposed to, we would call it harmful. Does that mean the organisms are going to die? No. That might be one cell and its proteins that are different doing the wrong thing. But if you've still got a thousand other specialised cells, differentiated cells, doing the correct thing because they've not got the harmful mutation, you're probably going to be fine. If it's beneficial, it's the opposite. Like we've got a different, we'll have a different triplet co, different amino acid structures, uh, sequence, sorry, uh, different protein tertiary structure. But maybe it's an advantage. So maybe this new protein function, maybe it's made it better at doing the job it originally did. Or maybe... It's a completely different protein doing a completely different job that helps you survive and therefore helps you to reproduce and helps you pass down your genes, maybe with this new beneficial mutation, to your offspring. One of the sort of classic, uh, classic examples of this could be, um, like I was going to say hair colour, but it's probably, probably I don't know how many times we camouflage with our hair. Um, think more of the animal kingdom in terms of like camouflage. A single mutation in some animals can completely change their coat colour. Like humans, we're a bit weird when it comes to sort of our hair colour. Um, there's a lot of genes that code for our hair colour. So that's why, like, I don't know anyone in my family who's ginger, but I clearly have elements of that gene because my beard goes a bit ginger. So it's clearly there. Um, and you'd think with me having that and Mrs. Bateson being a being a daywalker, um, you'd presume Cassie would have all this ginger and but no, she's she's this bright blonde. Um we're very unusual, but if you think like dogs, cats, single genes can sometimes completely change their coat colour. So if you change that gene in an embryo or a sperm or an egg at that very early stage. It could be a completely different coat colour. But if that helps it to camouflage, it might make that cat a better predator because it can sneak up on prey better or so on. B. Most common and why? The most common will be a neutral. The reason why is because of the degenerate code. Because there are multiple triplet codes that code for the same amino acid. So you can have that mutation, have a different base, yet have the same triplet code. And last one, explain the well, last one of this task, how the mutation that 40 the villages of Limon possess is beneficial under current environmental conditions. It would help if I read this beforehand. Let's see what Limone people have. Here's Limone. A tolerance to high cholesterol levels. Nice. 40 at extraordinary high levels of blood cholesterol with no apparent harm to the coronary arteries. Oh, brilliant. Their mutation was ultraproved by one amino acid, so it's a classic point mutation. And makes it 10 times more effective at mopping up excess cholesterol. Right, that's the, that is the gene I need. Um, so these individuals, their mutation, because they're able to basically mop up as well, but it's going to be like absorb, it's going to be break down, it's going to be something like that, the uh, cholesterol more effectively, they can handle a Western diet without risk of coronary heart disease. Current Western diet, very high of cholesterol, which it just generally is. Um, 
I, I know, uh, must admit, this, you can probably tell this worksheet's from about 10 or so years ago. With sort of the vegan movement going on and nowadays, there are less lower elements of it. But stereotypically, a Western diet is very much still uh, spreading around the world and um, it does have high levels of cholesterol. So having that mutation should decrease risk of disease like coronary heart disease. Sickle cell. So. Uh, sickle cell, this, this mutation, um, which affects the haemoglobin. Okay, so we're first asked questions for how many of the following are exhibited or coded in the DNA sequence above. So in terms of bases, if there's bases, I can just count. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There are 21 exhibited in that sequence above. Bear in mind, this is DNA, so it would have a second strand. So if you put 42 because you've, you, you've acknowledged there might be a second strand, that's fine. But the fact it has said exhibited, that kind of means what you can see. In terms of triplets, so divide that by three to get seven. And amino acids coded four. So you'd presume seven, but let's just double check that this is a stop codon or not. Does it say? Okay, fab. So it says it's 438 bases, so that's clearly not finished. So yeah, I'm happy that there are seven triplet codes in that displayed and therefore seven amino acids. <laughs> the MRA sequence for the transcribing DNA strand above. Okie dokie. Yeah. So <clears throat> the messenger RNA will be opposite to this, but wherever there is T, you would have U instead. So let's just follow it on. So it'd be G, U, G, C, A, C, C, U, G, A, C, U, C, C, U, G, let's just pause. Okay, it, it does say the one above. I, I was just pausing because obviously, if you have the mutation, this is the base that's different, but we're fine. Um, so, so we've still got the T, so therefore we'll go to an A and then G, G, A, G. Determine the amino acid sequence coded by the messenger RNA in question two above for the fragment of the normal protein we're studying here. Use the mRNA amino acid table consult the index. Have I provided one of them? I don't think I have. Yeah, sorry guys. I mean, there is, there was one obviously on the PowerPoint that I used uh, last time, but we're just going to ignore that. We're going to ignore that question. Again, you, you can just search on, on Google, but I, I ain't got time for that right now, I'm afraid. Um, okay, rewrite the transcribing DNA sequence uh, above. With the 17th, we've got to change from a T to an A. This is the mutation. So we're rewriting the DNA sequence. So literally, I'm not, I'm not going to to fit it in that space. It's just going to be messy. But effectively, I just want to write that, but write A there instead of T. Okay. Type of mutation is a point mutation. Write the mRNA sequence for the mutant's DNA strand above. It will be exactly the same as what we've done in question two. But that A there will instead now be a U. OK, that's the difference. Determine the amino acid sequence coded by the messenger RNA for the fragment of mutant protein using the table. So again, again, I'm, I'm not going to go back to the table, but it will be exactly the same as this as this one here. Except this triplet, instead of reading GAG, -G, now reads GUG. And that will probably give you a different amino acid. And explain how sickle cell mutation results in symptoms of the disease. So this is where we can look back up and tell us what's going on. So this point mutation gives us a faulty beta chain in the haemoglobin protein. You may remember haemoglobin is made of four polypeptide chains, two are alphas and two are betas. So this is affecting two 
of the four tertiary proteins that make up hemoglobin. Could that mutation causes red blood cells to deform into a sickly sort of shape, but only when deprived of oxygen. When they have oxygen, they actually do go back to a relatively normal shape. So if I were to explain this, I need to get across to the examiner that I understand protein structure. And the idea that that different single point mutation, that different base, codes for that different amino acid, which results in different folds and bonds when making the tertiary structure. Feel free to name some bonds like ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, etc., giving it a different shape. So that in this case, when oxygen is not bound, the hemoglobin actually precipitates, crystallizes, to give our red blood cells a different sickled shape. Okay, CF. An inherited disorder caused by mutation of the cystic fibrosis gene. An autosomal recessive condition, that means it's a recessive condition on one of your non-sex chromosomes. And the most common lethal one. One in 2,500 live births and 4% of us will carry the faulty allele. Uncommon Asians, Africans. The cystic fibrosis gene's protein product, called a CFTR, is a membrane-based protein. And it is involved in chloride transport. So think of it as one of those proteins in facilitate diffusion or active transport. If it's faulty, and there's more than 500 different mutations of this gene being described, if it's faulty, you can get various different sort of disease symptoms. Most commonly, obviously, that symptom is the expression of extra thick, sticky mucus, which sort of traps a lot of bacteria and can lead to repeated infection. Repeated infection in that particular area is completely debilitating. Um, and these individuals tend to die in 20s or early 30s, which obviously sucks. So it gives information about normal and abnormal, pro this normal and abnormal protein products. If it's this one, normal, 14,480 amino acids, our chloride ions are being correctly controlled. If it's one amino acid less, so bear in mind, if we're one amino acid less, is this indicating a deletion? Let's see. Um, now we can't control chloride ion balance in the cell, and that's going to affect water levels, and therefore that's going to affect how thick and sticky that mucus is. So this is on an autosome, on chromosome number seven. We have a mutation. It said, yes, a deletion. Ah, but a deletion, not just of one, but of an entire triplet. So you don't get a frame shift, but you do lose an entire amino, a single amino acid. It's just gone. And therefore that is going to massively affect how that amino acid chain folds, because it's going to form different bonds between adjacent R groups. And therefore you're going to get a different tertiary structure and therefore a different function. Apologies for that noise there. Apparently it fails to take up its position in the membrane. Different shape, different size, potentially. And leads to defective chloride transport. So the first thing to do is to take this big DNA strand and turn it into messenger RNA. So it's exactly what we've done before. Where it says CCG, you go GGC. TGG becomes ACC. TAA becomes AUU. Keep that going to the end. Again, using an amino acid table, again, just these are easily Googled. You just look at what this triplet from messenger RNA is and you turn it into whatever amino acid that is. For the mutant strand, it's exactly the same as question 1a, but don't include the UUU. You would have done that in that uh, third to last triplet. You would have done one saying UUU there. You don't include it here. In terms of mutation, it is a deletion mutation. A deletion.
Okay, and this question here, C, will be exactly the same as that, but obviously you are now missing the amino acid that is coded for by U, U, U. And write the missing amino acid underneath there. Suggesting why it's a disease with varying degrees of severity. Well, there are multiple mutations of this gene. Some are clearly completely changing the shape, so the protein can't even bind to the membrane. Some, however, might only slightly change its shape. So maybe only slightly change its function. So not that it's just not regulating chloride, maybe it's just not regulating it as well, making mucus maybe a, a smaller bit thicker and stickier. This thing, when you have multiple ways to mutate a protein, some could be, I mean, imagine we had, imagine we had a deletion bit actually do, instead made a frame shift. I mean, think how different that would be. This is just missing an amino acid. You haven't got the frame shift as well. Think how horrendous that would be. And then you might have some mutations which, you know, 500 mutations to cause a cystic fibrosis symptom. So none of them is well, neutral, none of them are silent. It could just be other little point mutations just slightly affecting one amino acid. Just making that missense mutation with changing the amino acid. With different mutations, you can get different functionality of that CFTR protein. There you go. Any questions from that? Drop us a message. Easy peasy. Let's look at the lac one. So again, expect this to be really hard. Like expect your brain to go by the time you finish this. Okay, let's roll. So to start the story, the description of what we're doing today is all happening within a bacteria called E. coli. Very common bacteria. We got lots of them naturally in our gut. And normally it breaks down, uses glucose, metabolizes glucose for respiration. Just like just like our cells do, you know? Aerobic respiration, you know, of course, we're gonna use glucose, aren't we? But if glucose is absent. And the disaccharide lactose is present. The presence of lactose seems to induce the production of a couple of different enzymes in the, in the E. coli. One called lactose permease, which helps lactose enter the cell. It basically it, it makes the, the lactose cell membrane more permeable to the, the lactose cell membrane. What am I about? It makes the E. coli cell membrane more permeable to lactose. It's clearly involved probably in putting like um, little uh, pro like channel proteins for lactose in the membrane. And you've got the other one called beta-galactosidase, which is an enzyme which is hydrolyzing lactose to make the monosaccharides glucose and galactose glucose that can obviously enter respiration as it, uh, and be metabolized. So, again, I'm an E. coli. In normal circumstances, I'm just going to respire and metabolize glucose. But if glucose isn't there and lactose is, I get observed to start producing two enzymes. Enzymes that weren't there prior. prior. Enzymes that are not there if glucose is present. Lactose permeates and beta galactosidase. And these two enzymes help me metabolize lactose. Pretty efficient. Sounds really helpful. But why? Like, like why in the absence of glucose, but only if lactose is present? Like, that only works in that perfect situation. If there's no glucose, but there is lactose. You then, the E. coli then makes these two enzymes. It switches on the genes for these two enzymes and boom, it can now metabolize lactose. Couldn't do it before. For me, this, oh, I, I, the part of this topic I love with inheritance is the fact that 
We are looking at examples of how your genes are controlled on a second by second basis. And I know this is E. coli and maybe that's a bit dull and boring, but this is happening in your bodies as well. You don't personally have these enzymes. Um, you definitely don't if you're lactose intolerant, but this single prokaryotic E. coli usually never switches on these genes because it's got glucose. Glucose disappears, but only if lactose is present, boom, you start making these two enzymes. So let me show you the part of the E. coli's genes that is useful. It's called the LAC operon. The LAC stands for lactose because these are all the genes involved in helping the E. coli metabolizing lactose. That's where it comes from, LAC operon. So this is a length of DNA. So from this side to this side, from the start of the eye to the end of what we, we describe as LAC Y, we've got 6,000 base pairs. Not all of it is a gene. This isn't one big gene. This is actually three genes and some control sites and a bit in the middle that does nothing. Or at least does nothing for the metabolism of lactose. So 6,000 base pairs long. And we've got an operator region here, LACO. Two structural genes. LAC Z and Y, these are the beta galactosidase and lactose permease described in the one above. These are the genes that are going to make the proteins that can metabolize lactose. Lactose permease increases the permeability of the membrane, so more lactose gets into the cell. Beta galactosidase breaks the lactose into its monosaccharides, glucose and galactose. And next, this operator region is a promoter region. The enzyme, RNA polymerase, you know, the enzyme that does transcription, has to bind here. If RNA polymerase binds here at the promoter region, these two enzymes will be transcribed. These two enzymes will be produced. And a small distance away is the regulatory gene. Call it I. And it codes for a protein called LAC I, as you'd expect. That's why it's I. And LAC I is a repressor protein. That repressor protein binds to this operator region here. And by doing so, it actually blocks and prevents the, promoter, the RNA polymerase from binding to the promoter region. And therefore, you don't transcribe LAC Z and LAC Y. You don't produce that messenger RNA that you don't produce those proteins. Now, that is basically it. But I'm very, very aware. If you can understand this, we need to show it. Don't we? we need to show this step by step exactly what's happening, don't we? So if you are like writing things as we go, just just pause this, but I'm I'm moving on to the next bit. Okay, lac operon. In normal situations, when glucose is present and the E. coli is happy to metabolize glucose for respiration, these genes, those structural genes, are switched off. Apologies, I've not got the gap in between. I'm just, I'll just do that bit in red. There, there's the big gap between the, the uh, promoter and operator regions and that regulatory gene at the start. Also, in this diagram, there are three structural genes. Um, technically, there are three, but in our A-level, we just learned the, the two key ones. The third one doesn't really do much. Well, it does, but it's not, it's not essential. So what should happen normally? In normal situations, when glucose is present... This regulatory gene gets transcribed, goes to a ribosome, and this protein that looks like a weird giraffe thing um, is produced. Now, this is a repressor protein. It will bind, because it's got a complementary shape to the specific shape of the operator region, it will bind to the operator region here. And look what it's done by binding. 
it's actually blocked part of the promoter region. So when RNA polymerase comes in, oh no! RNA polymerase can't bind to the promoter. Oh no, let's watch that again. Here's the highlight. Ooh, oh, can't do it. So RNA polymerase cannot attach. RNA polymerase will not work its way along. And it will not transcribe these structural genes here. It will not produce their mesto RNA. And therefore you will not get the proteins produced. So that is in normal circumstances when glucose is present in high levels. But if glucose disappears, and if lactose is present, you get this. So exactly the same operon, exactly the same sequence of 6,000 base pairs. Now again, I'll draw that in red, that represents the little gap there is between promoter and operator region and the regulatory gene. So, in the absence of glucose, presence of lactose, we still get our repressor protein. Regulatory gene is still being transcribed beautifully. But, lactose, being a bit of a bugger, binds to the repressor protein. And when it binds to the repressor protein, it changes the tertiary structure of that protein. And it means. It is now no longer the correct shape to bind to the operator region. It is inactive. So now watch. RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter region. It can transcribe the structural genes. These were the structural genes here. The messenger RNA of these structural genes will go to the ribosome and you'll produce the enzymes we need to metabolize lactose. You'll produce the lactose permease, which makes the cell membrane of the E. coli more permeable to lactose. It's going to be involved in like putting uh, more protein channels in the membrane to get more lactose into the cell. You're going to get beta galactosidase. That's the enzyme that is that is breaking down lactose into glucose and galactose. And you also get this one here at the bottom, which we don't need to learn about. So, again, rewind, go through the step by step that I've done again. Like I generally, I recommend like two or three times minimum. And this is the summary. The whole thing was a length of DNA 6,000 base pairs long. We have an operator region, LACO, and a promoter region in the middle. Right next to them are structural genes, the ones involved in metabolizing lactose. And a little way along the other side of the control sites was this regulatory gene that is always being transcribed and make and then translated into a repressor protein. If glucose is present, the repressor protein happily binds to the LACO and it blocks the RNA polymerase from binding to the promoter region. So LACZ and LACY are structural genes are not transcribed and our enzymes for lactose metabolism are not translated. But if there's no glucose and lactose is present, the repressor protein gets made but the lactose binds that repressor protein, making it a different shape so it can't bind to the operator region. Now, RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter and transcribe LACZ and LACY. Real-time gene expression. What I'd like you to do, please, and I will go through it this video as well, I'd like you to have a go at task five, which is a fill in the gaps. We like filling the gaps. Oh, sorry, I've just lost it. Okay. Task five, lack of one, filling in the gaps. So my belief is you completing this and going through this should probably more than be more than enough for the lesson. At least I hope I'm correct there.
So I'm not going to set task six now. Uh, we'll look at that next lesson instead. So pause me whilst you complete this because I'm going to go through it. When you're ready to go through it as a class or individuals, press play and have a green pen to like hopefully tick everything as you're hopefully beautifully correct. Here we go. An offeron is a length of DNA containing genes that code for one or more proteins along with base sequences which control whether or not the genes will be expressed. The genes that code for proteins are called structural genes. The bacterium E. coli contains a lac operon. The function of this operon is a good example of an interaction between genes and the environment. Because it's all about the presence and absence of glucose slash presence and absence of lactose. The lac operon has genes coding for the synthesis of two enzymes as well as an operator region and a promoter region. One enzyme called lactose permease enables the bacterial cell to take up lactose, acting as a pump in the cell surface membrane. The second enzyme, called, as if there's enough space there, uh, beta-galactosidase. Oh, how the monkey if I just spell it? Galac, I've just spelled that completely wrong. I think I was overwhelmed by the uh, lack of space. ga lac to -si. Days. Breaks down lactose into its constituent monosaccharides, or that would be glucose and galactose. Normally, when E. coli is grown on nutrient agar jelly that contains glucose but no lactose, it is not necessary to switch on the genes of the two enzymes, since it will result in a waste of both amino acids, because you have the amino acids making the enzymes. It would also be a waste of ATP. Protein synthesis needs ATP. So making these enzymes costs you energy. Costs you ATP. To prevent the structural genes from being expressed, a repressor protein synthesized. The protein is coded for by yet another gene located elsewhere from the bacterial DNA called a regulatory gene. The repressor protein has two binding sites. One of this protein binds to the operator region of the DNA, preventing the enzyme RNA polymerase from binding to the promoter region. This means the mRNA for the two enzymes will not be transcribed and the enzymes will not be synthesized. When E. coli is grown on agar jelly containing only lactose, some lactose enters the cell by diffusion. The lactose fits into the second binding site. A well stressed diffusion, it is likely to be facilitated diffusion. I should probably clarify that. The lactose fits into the second binding site on the repressor. Binding alters the tertiary structure of the repressor, changing its shape. The repressor will now no longer bind with the operator region of the operon and the enzyme RNA polymerase can know now bind to the promoter and start transcribing the genes for the two enzymes so the bacteria can use the lactose in the growth medium. Yay, I got 100%. So thank you for your time today. Hopefully that hasn't taken the full hour. If it hasn't, rewind, watch the step by step, watch like the, I know it's not really an animation, but watch it again, I promise. It will sink in the more you watch it. So, thank you very much for today. Bye.